Welcome to the Awaken the Awesome podcast with your host, Olivier D. This is Awaken the Awesome, a podcast where we acknowledge that we are all in this together. Through enlightening conversations and personal insights, we like to engage with individuals just like you who show us how they are bringing a little bit of awesomeness along their individual journeys. Our hope is to inspire you to always keep pushing and to stay awesome along the way. I was a college dropout when I picked up the first personal finance book that I can truly say opened my eyes to the importance of financial literacy. Ever since then, be it as a young man living in an apartment the size of a shoebox or as a married father of two, money and its impact on our daily lives has always been on my mind. There's a lot to be said about the seeds to be sown early and giving our children the proper tools that will help them achieve financial independence, which is why my next guest felt so appropriate to have on the program. Give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you'll feed him for a lifetime. This is certainly the motto that Galita Pericles has proudly chosen to guide her mission as a certified financial education instructor. From being a provider for her family at an early age to now teaching millennials how to master their finances and live the life they want through her catalog of online courses and workshops, her journey is a testament to her amazing drive and commitment. On this episode, Galita shares her personal story written through pages of personal struggle, but also, and most importantly, with a voice that speaks truth, dedication, and discipline. We touch on the importance of proper financial literacy, the courage to take action, faith in the process, and so much more. So let's get into this. Awaken the Awesome, episode 130 with Galita Pericles. Here we go. It is, first of all, a pleasure and an honor and a thrill uh, to welcome you on the podcast, Galita, really, because uh, it's just, uh, just a friend uh, that highlighted your content on Instagram. And ever since I click follow, I really, really want to celebrate you for uh, basically your mission, as I was saying out the air, but because it takes a very big sense of um, you know, service and wanting to do good. And because that's something that comes across every single post that you put out. There's that sense of you know, dedication and of course, as a certified financial education instructor, you know, just not just because that's what you do, but because it's something that you believe in throughout all your personal stories and all the adventures and misadventures uh, that you share with us. There's that sense of generosity and gift of self that you can only, you know, admire because especially in these times of uncertainty where you realize that, you know what, how can we help? You know, how can we do better and how, how can we, you know, connect with other people and try to help? What, what am I good at and what, how can I uh, put my skills uh, and expertise and knowledge and, you know, just time because time is so precious you know to help people elevate themselves and especially in our finances because it's important everybody's been talking about you know take care of your health you know everybody's trying to you know take walks uh you know right. take care <laughs> take care of our families take care of our loved ones and with all these things with all this great period of very severe uncertainty you don't shy away from helping us you know even through some very uh, practical but very truthful uh, posts and comments and commentaries and you know courses to remind us it's also very imperative right now that we have even now even a greater sense of control over our finances and you know we're going to talk a little bit about that but first of all it's just one way for me to open it's like seriously and truly i just want to open uh, celebrate you and welcome you to the podcast thanks so much for being here thank you so much for having me i'm really honored that you allowed me to come on here to share my start story, share anything that I have to say. So I'm really honored to be here and I really appreciate you for having me. There, there's so much stuff that you share and so much that we could get into, but there was one post um, recently over Instagram because, you know, I connected with you over on LinkedIn and everything. So I'm really keeping up uh, with all the stuff that you put, we pushed around and I even signed up for one of your courses and I want to thank you for that. Yeah. And, but there's a part, there's a part, oh, not a problem, man. We have a rising tide lifts all ships because I want to get into that myself, you know, investing because again, I'm never shy, shying away from stuff that I don't know, but it's definitely a great opportunity to actually like, you know, try to get to know stuff that you don't know. So it's, so always the pleasure to sign up. But there was one post that you put out and those words were very simple, but it speaks a lot in regards to how people, I believe, uh, again, always have that discomfort or taboo about, you know, their financial freedom. And mm -hmm. you put it very simply, fear will paralyze you. And mm -hmm. why that hit me 
personally is because I think back to a time where, unfortunately, I also I was dealing with particular financial difficulties. And, you know, whether through credit card debt or, you know, just loss of job and not making enough money and, you know, trying to do right by my wife, trying to do right by my kids and working two jobs and, you know, the entire like, you know, very traditional scenario of just like trying to make ends meet. And, you know, you're right, you know, you're, you're ditching the calls from the creditors, you're ditching the calls from the banks and you're paying here, but you're not paying there. And you realize at some point, you know, math is math. Numbers don't lie. Finances are, you know, black or white. And at this, at, there's a, comes a certain point uh, where you have to take ownership and you have to take accountability of where you are and what can be done. But if you keep falling into the trap of the fear it will paralyze you and you're not going to take action. And you're very big about that accountability and discipline and, you know, taking that decision to do better. And that's why I love those words. I was just wondering if that quote means the same to you or am I just like shooting it out there into the universe? (laughs) Sorry. Oh man, that post was so long ago. Um, You know, a lot of times I think about so many things, but I, they don't really get to go on social media because I'm either thinking about it while I'm going to bed or I'm not at a time where I'm on social media. So I have like a full of notes where I do put my ideas and what I want to share. And a lot of times I'm like, oh, I don't want to post that today because I'm either too lazy or, I'm, you know, I'm all into the Instagram you know, looking good, make people feel like they can relate to my posts and the way it looks and the aesthetics. So sometimes I don't even post it. But at the time when I posted Fear Will Paralyze You, it was more so all, uh, for even a wake up call for me. Um, it was kind of like for me stepping out of my comfort zone. And I realized that I needed to do something, but I was so fearful of what it may not happen. So I was more so focused on what if this doesn't work? What if this doesn't happen? What if this doesn't work out for me? So I was so focused on that. And then I had to take a moment and realize that if I keep thinking about the things that is not going to go right. And sometimes I do that a lot myself and I have to remind myself and I'm, I guess you can say that it's due to the way that I grew up. I have, I'm not, I can be very optimistic, but sometimes life will just weigh me down and I keep thinking that things are not going to work and I fear of doing certain things. And not that particular time, that post was really for me and I was just sharing it out there because I know some people are fearful of a lot of things. It can be anything. It can be whether or not you want to go to school or whether or not you want to leave your job or whether or not you want to, you know, start investing, start saving money, you probably think if I save $25 a week, that's not going to help me. And, you know, these thoughts will paralyze you because you'll be stuck in the same situation that you're in. So stop thinking about why it's so fearful to do certain thing, but actually go ahead and do it. Because if you're just stuck in that state of mind, you're only going to be stuck and glued to that state of mind. And it's going to paralyze you. You're not going to grow from there because you're so fearful of the negative that can happen. And not you're not, you're not willing to face what the brighter side of things, you know, I can easily, Um, say that I'm so I'm scared to quit my job but then again what if I do quit my job and then I found something so much better or I finally get to what my passion really is because I'm not working a job where I'm robotic and I hate it every day but I'm actually actually have time to go somewhere else to another career go back to school or you know working on my passion. So you would never discover those things if you're stuck because you're scared. The fear will always be everybody's go-to excuse because it's so easy to just come up with a laundry list of reasons why we can't. And sometimes they are coming from our immediate environment. But as you said, sometimes it's that internal dialogue that's just yeah. going to creep back up and it's just going to say like, well, I don't have enough money. Oh, I don't, I didn't go to college or I don't know how to run a business. What do I know about being an entrepreneur? What do I know about stock and investing and stuff? And the excuses abound. So what are your tips? How did you overcome that, that paralysis of like not taking action? Because that's always like on the other end of that decision where the greatness happens. If I'm hearing you correct, how did you, uh, you know, go over that hurdle? 
Man, I, I would say a lot of my life, I would, I had to step out on fear because I had no choice. So growing up, that kind of molded me um, because I didn't have a choice. It was either I do it, I step out on fear, or I don't do it. And at the time, it was either, either decision would have been scary. Mm-hmm. So I just chose a decision, even though it's bad, at least the outcome would have been greater. So with that being said, a lot of times, like I said, sometimes I can be very optimistic, but sometimes, you know, that internal subconscious mind just keeps playing with you and makes you think that you can't do a lot of things. So a lot of the decisions that I do make, they are sometimes they're very, a lot of times they're very rational. So I don't try to jump the gun. I do think about it. And I do think about the worst case scenario. I'm very meticulous. I'm very like, okay, so if this doesn't work, I need plan B, C, D, E, F, G. Right. Um, A lot of times I feel like my plan A is pretty solid. I don't really work on plan B, but because I want so hard for A to work and I feel like A has to work, but I know life happens. So I have to be realistic. Um, So it's just a matter of, just going and do it despite um i remember the last one of the one of the craziest decisions that i made on you know when people w- were saying so many things was i believe i would say um quitting my job without another job lined up and i was at the point where i was like you know what i have had enough and i don't want to be here anymore and I don't care if you guys were giving me $100 an hour at this point. I have had enough and I don't want to be here anymore. I will give you guys a proper notice, but I don't want to be here anymore. And I've got to that point where it was, I was just tired and fed up because I didn't like the circumstances of the position. Mm-hmm. I didn't leave to go into entrepreneurship or anything like that. I left because I had enough and I just didn't want to keep giving out excuses as to why I didn't want to do better with my life. I knew that even if I didn't find a job, that I would be better off not being there than to be there and getting a paycheck. That sounds so familiar. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to us can relate so much. I certainly can, because I went through that rat race, you know, a couple of times, actually, where, you know, you give so much of your time, you give so much of your, you know, your energy, uh, you know, your mental energy, your physical energy, your presence, and you always keep justifying. And then at a certain point, you come, you become, as you put it, you know, you become fed up, not just with the job, but with yourself for taking it on and taking it on and taking it on. And, you know, it feels like, you know, you know, for me, you know, just like you're, you're a little bit of shame, but you know, it's something that you need to be celebrated for because so many people I'm sure, and I'm sure you've come across with some of those. I'm probably, you probably have people who still work there that, you know, refuse to just accept the fact that, you know what, enough is enough. And why is it so hard? Do you think to just, you know, just put yourself first and, you know, even if it is selfish, but there's nothing wrong with that. You need to be able to do what's right for you. But why is it so hard for some people? I feel like the reason why it's so hard for some people is because, you know, it has been years of the same condition of going to work and getting a job and retiring. So a lot of people have that mindset, their grandparents, great-grandparents. It's the same concept. You go to work, you retire, and then that's it. You have grandkids and that's it. So, and then the bills are just here. They're, they, they're going to be, they're going to keep coming. They're not going anywhere. They're, they're going to be here. And a lot of people don't have a financial plan. Um, they, they need the job because if they don't, if the job is closed for two weeks, they're going to be in so much debt because they're literally working for the next paycheck. And by the time they get the next paycheck, it's already gone. So if you put that type of life scenario and you asking that person to quit their cushion or their livelihood, it's going to be very hard. And that's, that's where that fear comes in because they don't think they're so conditioned to it where I'm going to wake up, go to work. I know I'm going to be going to get, receive a paycheck in the next week, next two weeks. It's so conditioned that it's, 
it's like a paradigm and they're just do, living the same paradigm over and over and over again. And they're not planning for their financial future. They're not planning to exit. They're just living every single day with that same paradigm every single day. So for them to kind of say enough is enough, even if they feel like enough is enough, then it's okay, I'm going to quit this job, but where am I going to get money? You know, and mm-hmm. that's another issue, especially if they have children or a family, a husband and wife. It's, you know, I want to be able to provide for my family. So they don't know where they're going to find that. So there are so many things that people can do in order for them to get out this paradigm, but no one is willing to do it because it requires work and it requires sacrifice. So a lot of people who are just so used to the norm, you know, a lot of people just go to work Monday through Friday, a happy hour on Friday night, Saturday, they relax, Sunday, they get ready just to repeat the same cycle of years. They see their parents do it. They're doing it right now. And their children are probably going to be doing the same thing. So it's, it's, and then a lot of people are complaining. So it's okay that I'm going to be at a job that I'm not going to like it and I'm not going to like my coworkers. So it's kind of like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So now think about knowing that this is what you're supposed to do. And then someone is telling you that there is something better on the other side that you've never seen that you don't even know. So it's going to be very hard for someone like that to kind of unlearn and relearn that there is something better And I just need to, I owe this to myself to get something better because especially if you're at a job that you don't like, you spend most of your time there and it's not good for you mentally. Um, It's not a good thing to be at a job where you spend most of your time and you don't even like half of the people there. And that's the mindset that I had in mind, not because I didn't like the people. I just didn't like certain management Mm -hmm. people there and the way that they were running the company not everyone was bad. And, and when I was saying something, I felt like my voice wasn't heard. And I knew that that was not the place for me because I knew that I deserved better. So I feel like another thing you can do is, do you deserve better than this? Like you have to realize I deserve better than this because I know I bring so much more to the table. And if you can't see, it's kind of like a bad boyfriend. You know, mm-hmm. if you can't see that I'm of this great value to you and you keep abusing me in this relationship, then I don't need to be in it. Wow. See, that's word right there. See, (laughs) just taking ownership of you or where you are and what you want for warts and all for the good and the bad. As you said, not everybody was terrible. Just I did not feel well. I did not feel good. I did not feel as if I was getting what I deserved. And you have to make a decision. You have to pivot. And that's the leap that we often talk about. You know, that's the, you know, take the, you have, you have to take the plunge. And eventually, as you said, you have to work on fear, but eventually, you know what? Greater circumstances can happen. And I celebrate you for that. And it's nice to see you on the other end. That, congratulations, man. That's a really, really big thing for you. Really cool. Really cool. Uh, I wanted to circle back because um, I read uh, in a recent, well, not recent, I read on a, an article that was posted about you on Voyager MIA. And I read something that really, like, you know, humbled me. You actually came to the States and taking care of your mom and your brother? Yes. Wow. Well, how old were you when you came? When you came to the US? 11. 11. Wow. Walk us through that. What's it like? It's like having to take care of your family. Because like, as you put it, you know, you just woke up one day and now you're responsible, like intimately responsible for your family. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that is one of, um, you know, one of the biggest struggles. Um, Honestly, this is like a total honest moment right now. Um, This is one of the biggest struggles that I live with daily because um, there are a lot of, I feel like a lot of my childhood was robbed because I had to grow up so early. Um, As soon as I turned 18, the first thing to do was I know my mom was back home, so I wanted to bring her on. So at 19, 20 years old, I was already, you know, the process takes a little time, a couple years to come in mm-hmm. for her to come in. Um, but by 21, she was already here and I was already taking care of her. And, you know, and I had to be responsible for us, you know, where we're going to eat, you know, buying, buying a home for us to live in. Um, that's how I was introduced into home ownership because she was here and I'm here and 
we have to live somewhere. So I was going to rent. And then the realtor that I asked the realtor, Hey, you know, I want, I want to rent a property. Um, and then he's like, Hey, how much do you make yearly? And do you have at least 4% to put down on a home for, to get an FHA loan? And I said, yeah, I have way over that. And he's like, well, let's see if we can get you approved for a home. And I said, sure. I didn't know anything about that. I was, you know, I was 21 years old looking for a home. That was one of the most stressful moments in my life. Um, I had to, you know, still take care of her, take care of myself, you know, buy, oh, I'm a new homeowner and I'm a single 22 year old with a mortgage, a car payment and, and my mom to take care of. Oh, wow. And so it was a quick wake up call. And then it life totally changed for me. So a lot of things that I wanted to do for myself, I ended up having to sacrifice that because I had to pretty much take care of us. And then my brother came along and then he's, we have a 20 year age difference. So he, he was very small. And then I had to take care of him too, because she was not capable of taking care of him. So it was me taking care of the both of them. Wow. Um, so that, that ended up being a burden um, in a good way. Well, it's no burden is good, but I'm not saying it because I regret it, but I'm saying that it was heavy at such a young age to be able to do so. Um, I do love them very dearly, but even till this day, I still have to, you know, help them out. Because, you know, she's still, it's, it has only been five years from now. So she's still getting the hang of things and I still have to take care of them and, you know, help. You have them to be the adult for everybody. Yes, pretty yeah. much. Financially, I have to assist everyone. So it, it puts a lot of my dreams and a lot of things that I wanted to do. Um, I put them to the side to be able to be that, you know, parent, I, I guess, per se for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that does affect me um, mentally because I feel like it's very unfortunate for me to have to go through that, especially as a child. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the childhood memories that or even college experience that I was not able to get because I was working and going to college at the same time. So, oh, wow. so a lot of things that I do feel really bad about because I'm like, you know, I feel like I didn't as a child. That was a lot to put on a kid. It's true. It's true. Because I can only imagine, I mean, I read that and I read your, I read your personal account that you shared on the article and mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that must've been a lot to deal with. You just wake up one day and basically you have to take care of everything for two yeah. people. Yeah. And, and I hear you, I hear you. Cause again, you're not trying to sugarcoat it. You're not trying to say that, you know, you're just going to not going to put any taboo on it and it just sound resentful, but you're speaking a truth where you're allowed to say that, yeah, okay, I had to give up a lot. So I'm pretty sure that's where it comes from. A lot of the posts that you share are like very firm. They're very, you know, direct. And I know that comes from a personal place, discipline, you know, <laughs> patience, sacrifice, you know, a thing or two about that. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And you know, it's so crazy that you say direct because I do try to not make it so direct because I feel like a lot of people think that I'm so blunt and I'm like, I'm, and I'm like, a lot of things that I do post are, I feel like they're more the sugar coated side. And, it, and I, and I, a lot of things that I really want to say, I have to think about the release the bluntness. <laughs> and I feel like I'm not, I'm not blunt at all. And everybody's like, you're very direct and blunt. And I'm like, really? Because I, I should have called a lot of things. If you say that's sugar-coated, I really, I, like, open up another page, call it unfiltered, financial quench unfiltered, <laughs> and I'm just going to subscribe right now, like, seriously, because it's definitely stuff that people need to hear. You know why? Because, like, unfortunately, we need to understand that there is an inherent importance. As you said, now is the best time to live in a time where, you know, just a side job uh, an additional stream of income is a necessity. It's an obligation. You sing about, you know, the, the, the importance of building a financial legacy, you know, for our descendants, a breaking, you know, financial habits. It's something that comes from a very pure, genuine place. And I was really curious about that. I was like, you know, where did that germinate? Where did the seeds start coming into, you know, the blooming of this quest towards like, you know, financial education and, you know, helping people do better for their financial, financial lives? Where did that start from? For me, I was... 
it, I guess the good side of me having to grow up early was me learning about financial uh, literacy very early on, uh, self-taught. Um, so because I knew that I had to grow up early, I decided to learn about how finance works and how credit works. That was the first thing that I tackled on was I need to get my credit because I know credit is good, but I don't even know what, how it works. I just know I need a good credit score. So one of the first things that I looked up was how, what, how is a credit score made up of? And it was something that you know, growing up, I would hear people say, you need good credit, but nobody tells you how to get it or how to, what, what is a, how's your credit portfolio made up of? No one is saying that, but everybody's saying that it's good, but you know, can you imagine, okay, this is good. This is good, but you don't even know what it is. What it is. So one of my things was I was very thirsty, I guess, to find out how credit works. So once I found out how credit works and how we can really determine what you really pay for something that you finance. So I started to take my credit very seriously because I, at 18 years old, I was like, I need to first my first credit card. I knew that I'm supposed to make a payment every month, but what I didn't know was the utilization was a factor. So I shouldn't be maxing out my card just because I'm making a minimum monthly payment. And I was not aware that of that my minimum monthly payment was not really doing anything to my credit. To, to my credit card balance something so was, that really people that people <laughs> are still to this day that don't know but i'm sorry i interrupted you i'm sorry no problem yeah they a lot of people don't really know like how it works what makes up their whole credit portfolio what their rights are when it comes to credit so i spent a lot of time learning about how it works because i knew that it i needed to ha- be ready so i don't have to get ready whenever a situation came because for example when it came time for me to buy the house i had the money and i had the credit if i didn't have neither one or if i was missing one i was not going to be able to make that transaction happen so i knew that i had to whatever situation i'm in i have to be ready for whatever happens even if i don't have any plans on buying a house or a car but you never know you can get into a car accident you can lose your home and you need to buy something else or you can try to move out because your roommate is bad and now you need your credit you, you just never know. know so i knew that it was important to me so fortunately enough i learned a lot about how credit works and i knew that i didn't learn any of it i was in business school in college i i my degree was accounting and we never touched about any of this financial stuff we didn't touch about it in high school and in college and i'm like so when when are they going to be teaching me about this right so a lot of my friends i was making a lot of good decisions and talking about finance and how it's important And I realized that a lot of them didn't have that privilege because they have their parents, they stayed at home, so they didn't really have to worry about credit or trying to survive. So they really didn't know and they would come to me to ask to ask me questions about how finance or how credit about how investing a little bit works at that time I was not fully developed with investing but I Mm -hmm. knew that this was another vehicle to get me to where I want to go and a lot of them didn't know about it and they were asking me. So as the more they ask me, the more that I was intrigued if I didn't know the answer, because I really want to know, I want to have an answer for them and they make sense. So I, that also inspired me to research more and find, trying to find out how finance works. And that also made me realize that there is no financial education out there. So if you grew up in, you know, low, middle class or low, uh, lower, lower class, your parents definitely probably didn't don't even know how it works. So if they don't even have that information to pass down, then it's going to, re- the same cycle is going to be repeating itself. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized that we need more than whatever, you know, designers or whatever, we need some financial literacy. That's what's going to help us make decisions know what decisions to make when it comes to your finances. And I realized that we lacked so much of it and that it was not present in school. Your parents didn't teach it to you. It was either you would have to go through an experience in life that was really bad. And now you have to undo it. And that's when you learn about it. 
And, you know, talking about the school curriculum, because you speak about that a lot as well, what, is so, what are some of the basics that, you know, we should be encouraging our, chi- our, our children to actually take up? I've got two young kids myself, and, you know, I read this a lot. And, like, you know, schools are not teaching our children the basics of financial literacy. What are some of the basics that we actually, you know, could pass down to our kids? Just a, some basic tips. What, what, what can we teach them? Definitely how credit works. Definitely um, putting them into your, you know, as an authorized user in your account very early on. Um, t- having a custodial account for them so they can start investing early. Um, <clears throat> teaching them how money works and how to manage their money. Why budgeting works. How to track their expenses. Not just only giving them allowances, but make sure they're tracking how much money they have, their expenses, how to balance their checkbooks, what is a checking account, what is it for. Um, General basic knowledge like that, I feel like should definitely be taught, especially when you're a junior or senior in high school, you're gonna go off to college, how credit card works, how interest works. These things are very basic. Um, I feel like they should be taught in schools so at least when the children get out, they're getting all these credit card offers in the mail and they don't even know what it is. They just know it's credit card, it's money that's not in their bank account and they're swiping left and right. And then when they can't make a payment, they just forget about it. And then a couple of years later, they want to buy a car, they have bad credit and now they're paying 20% interest on the car and their monthly payment is $500 and they're driving a, a, a normal car when their monthly payment should be about $200. So if we set the right seeds of, you know, discipline and education and responsibility, mm-hmm. we're going to reap the rewards down the, down the line. As you keep saying all the time, it's like, you know, it's not about how you start, but, you know, where you finish and you need to set the right habits way, way, way early so that you can see, because everybody wants to re- get rich quick, right? Everybody wants the, the, yeah. the, the quick, the, the quick fix. But yeah. <laughs> if I understand correctly, and you say this a lot, see, I read a lot. You say this a lot. It's about the long game. It's about, you know, putting in the marathon. That's where you read the rewards. Yes. A lot of people want to, it's, It's kind of, especially now in this day and age where a lot of things are on display because of social media, there are a lot of competitions. There are a lot of people who are, you feel yourself, sometimes you compare yourself. Am I doing better? I should be ahead. I should be doing more. Sometimes that, you know, that happens to me all the time. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes where you feel like you're not doing enough and you feel like you, if only you can get a quick $20,000 $20,000 real fast and you can, you know, it, your life will be so much, so much better. And that is why a lot of companies will target people subliminally. Oh, I can't even say that word, but subliminally. <laughs> yes, subliminally. They'll target people's pain points of kind of tell in a, in a way in, in they're just smooth it in trying to tell you that they can teach you a way you can get rich quick quick because they know a lot of people want that so they'll target those pain points just because they know that that's what people want and anything that is quick is probably not you're not going to appreciate it and it's probably going to dissolve faster than if it's something that you put in the hard work you actually know how it works and if something goes left you can kind of shift it to make it make sense Rather than if it's just something like it's really quick, you got it fast, you don't even know how it got there, you don't even know how to redeem yourself as things go left. That's why that's why a lot of people say it all the time, a lot of lottery winners, they'll get the money and then they'll go broke again because they don't they didn't really work hard for it. They it just kinda happened. They're never used to that amount of money. What am I gonna do with all this money? Exactly. So they just blow it and then the money is gone. But if it's something that they work through and they put it in their time, they worked really hard for it. The chances of them blowing it is really slim. You know, one of, you know, and I had the great opportunity. This is a, just a personal story. Back in the time, like, you know, I had like, uh, let's just say some really off time in college. And I don't know why I was hanging out at the library. And for whatever reason, one of my favorite financial literacy books, actually the automatic millionaire 
And that's why I learned about compound interest and like, you know what, hey, if you just take your paycheck, grab your paycheck and look at this line that says gross and everything they take away from you, take 10% from that and see what happens. I'm like, okay, sure. I'll bite. I don't have a car. I don't have, I have a very low rent. I don't have any major expenses. We're talking about the long game here. I'm like, okay, sure. Let me just save. Let me just say, he said 10%. Hey, you know what? I calculated it again. Numbers don't lie. I went for 20%. And you realize over time, over the course of a year, I had a girlfriend at the time and I just walked up to her and said, Hey, you want to take a vacation? <laughs> because <laughs> like, when you don't pay because i i set up automatic automatic withdrawals mm-hmm. and eventually you realize you open up your account like oh okay exactly just, and i'm like you you want to go on vacation and when you set those seeds and we're talking about the discipline because you said it so well because i do remember hanging out on campus and you had these 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 people showing up with t-shirts and bags and mugs and say hey sign here what is this it's a credit card i did not ask you for a credit card but a lot as you said a lot of students because they did not have that education you know because everything was provided for them and by a certain time you get to being accountable for yourself and you realize you know you just sign your name and then you just swipe and you swipe and you swipe and you swipe and you don't understand how this stuff works because it is a game and there are rules to this. There's levels to this shit. Yeah. <laughs> and you realize that it can cost you a hell of a lot more than you think for exactly. a really long time. Exactly. And, you know, we need people like you to always keep reminding us that because it's become very severe, especially in these times of uncertainty, as I keep saying, fortunately, there's a lot going on. A lot of people have had to make arrangements and, you know, people have been missing payments. It's a very stressful time for a lot of people, but people need to know that it's possible. It is possible. And it is possible. it's, it's something that, you know, that I applaud you for because um, I, I don't want to skip over this one because this was such a fun story to read about, you know, we're talking about the, uh, the house that you purchased and you talked about it. Uh, at length through many posts here was talking about it was one of the scariest times of your life but also the most exciting times you know so uh-huh. i believe that you sold the house uh, as i believe yes i did Hopefully. okay so how, how for because again buying a house for me when we bought the house like you know seven or eight years ago it was like such a stressful time but you know you made it seem like an adventure and i was just wondering like first of all why did you want to buy a house? Why did we sell it? And you talked about renovating it yourself. That seems kind of an adventure. And this is where, you know, a lot of people will probably it's like, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to renovate it yourself? Why, 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 why? And I would just applaud you for just like seeing it through because when someone follows their own journey and their own truth, because naysayers are all over the place and I want to applaud you for that. But you know, what, what, what prompted you to buy a house? Um, because I, what prompted me to buy the house was because my mom was coming here and I need, I knew, I did, I didn't, I don't have a relationship with my father. So it was either, you know, we go rent somewhere or buy a house. Like I said, the, the realtor that I was looking, you know, to help me, he asked me if I had the down payment and to pay closing costs and also um, if my credit was good and I said, yes. And he said, well, let's try to see if we can get a house instead. So that's how that came about because I didn't know that wasn't my plan because I felt like I did, wasn't qualified to buy a home. I was 21 and I didn't know what was going on. So that's what prompted me to buy the house. And then I ended up doing what I found out now it's, is called house hacking where I had a roommate and um, eventually he ended up leaving because he was going to move in with his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. So he ended up leaving. So, and it was about a couple months. I couldn't find a very good roommate. So I, re- I had a three bedroom, two bath home with a pool, the light bill and everything was going really high. And it, I was by myself paying all the bills. And I said, you know what? That's very expensive. I need to find a family who's going to occupy all of this and pay, you know, pay me really high rent. And I looked at the rent in the, in the neighborhood and it was pretty significant. It was almost doubled what my mortgage was. So I said, I would, (laughs) I would have them pay me rent every month and I will go rent an apartment that is way smaller and that's going to be, you know, very half of what they're going to be paying me for rent. Wow. So okay. That's how I ended up. Um, that's how I ended up, um, you know, renting the home. And then after I left my job, um, I thought I was going to be very qualified 
to get another job based on the experience that I had. And it was not the best for me. It was, I could not find a job to save my life. I was going through so many job interviews and I was not getting hired. And I was like, what is wrong with me? Maybe I shouldn't have left. A lot of people are saying, yo, you know, you should have found a job first. And then you start to regret leaving. But then you know that you left because it was a good reason. But then, you know, yes. I was questioning myself and I'm like, I was stupid. Maybe I shouldn't have left. I should have stayed. Um, so then I, re- I realized, I was like, you know what? This is the only asset that I have. And it's going to make sense if I sell it. And, and I, so I don't have to be, because my tenant's lease was coming up. And I said, so I don't have to have a rent where I'm s- staying at. And also having to pay mortgage, a mortgage. In, in case I don't find someone to rent it. So I decided to sell the house. But then I said, if I sell it the way it is, they're not going to give me a lot of money for it. So I said, I have to renovate it because I can spend less money doing the renovation and I can up the price because it's already, it's moving ready. Rather than, oh, the, you know, the cabinets are older, the bathrooms are older, you're going to get less money. But if there I remodel it, I can get three times my investment for the remodeling. So I decided to remodel it. And I decided to, that's, this is where staying ready so you don't have to get ready comes in when it comes to your credit. I went, I wanted, I had money saved up. But then I wanted to use that just in case I didn't sell the home. Mm -hmm. So at least I can pay for where I'm staying and I had to pay the mortgage because at one point I was was paying both because I didn't sell the house on time. So I I said, I'm going to the bank and I'm going to ask them for a loan. That is where it's very important to always keep your credit fine because I didn't have a job, but because my credit was so good, they didn't ask me to prove my income. Wow. Yes. So that's your calling card right there. Your credit history is already your calling card. Yes, exactly. So they didn't even ask me to prove them that I, a lot of times where you go, you know, you go buy a car, anything on credit, they'll ask you, you know, show me your recent pay stub. Mm-hmm. I didn't have pay stubs. So I was always, I just went and put the, my income as my last income that I was getting at my job. Um, so they can qualify me for the loan. But then I said, my only hurdle was, I said, God, please don't let them ask me for a pay stub because I don't have one. So they didn't ask me for a pay stub in three days. They ACH the, the, the money to my bank account. And I was able to use that to do the remodeling. And after I sold the home and pay them back. So it's kind of like a, a bank free loan uh, using other people's money. Using other people's money. Project. So all of that came to mind because I was put in a situation where I had no choice. So you start becoming very clever and you start using your mind in ways that you did not think possible because if I was still working at my job that I didn't like, I would have made any of these decisions and I would have have known that, you know, what I'm able to do because I would have not done it. So because I was put in a situation where you either have to do it or you're going to be stuck so I just started thinking very clever and I started making decisions. And I thankfully the guy that the contractor that I hired, um, he was through my realtor. Uh-huh. He, he was, he was in between jobs, not in between jobs, but he was in between contracts. Uh-huh. So he was not doing much for about a month. He didn't have any big contract for about a month because he does real big mansions and he was able to do my little home. And then he said, Hey, I have a couple of time off. I'll do it for you for half because you know, you, you, you're a young girl and you, you know, you seems like you, you need this fast. I can work it really fast for you and you can just pay me half the cost. And I was like, wow. Wow. You know, so I was the like, universe yeah. aligns, man. Cool. Yes, it's crazy. It was just like working. And then he said, I can do it for you in less than a month. And he put, uh, wood flooring he rented he painted the whole house he did put install kitchen cabinets and he did both bathrooms and he refinished the den is he in montreal uh, I, I, I need a guy <laughs> <laughs> he's in florida he's in south florida so he did all of that in less than a month and it was super impressive and i was shocked myself and 
a lot of times I was very depressed because there were a lot of off, you know, with selling a home, even with buying a home, you get turned down. Somebody else chose a home before you. So I was on a seller and a lot of people would do inspections and they would back out. You know, a lot of contracts will fall through or the customer did not qualify. That's going to be really stressful. uh, Yeah, that's very stressful. And then at the time I didn't have a full-time job. I was figuring things out. And I had a mortgage, I had rent, and I had people to take care of. And it was very stressful for me. It was a very stressful time because at one point I didn't know what to do. And I was going to study abroad to Argentina in the middle of selling the home. And I'm just traveling and I'm just like, God, please help me because I'm supposed to be traveling because I had registered to study abroad before quitting the job and I had already paid. So I figured I might as well just, I already paid for it. I might as well just go and whatever happens, happens. And in the middle of selling the home, I was in South America. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Was in South America, um, studying, trying to stay focused. My realtor is texting me and he's telling me this person dropped and I'm just like, trying to stay focused and I'm like, man, this is really sad. And sometimes I get really sad at night because, because I'm like, man, God, what is going to happen for me? Because this is a really tough situation. And I just had to stay positive. You know, he was encouraging me. My realtor was encouraging me, but I didn't tell anyone that what I was going through. So everything was pretty normal. Um, so, but I was just internally, I was like, man, this is like, I was thinking like, what have you, what have you done? (laughs) Wow. I'm just cheering you on. You can't see me, but I'm cheering you on because you know what? A lot of people, you know, just look at all the stories that we post and all the little, you know, just a little post everywhere and just think, oh, we've got it made and you got it all figured out. And these are about the the battles and what I was talking about in the beginning, the adventures and the misadventures of our personal journey. And I hear courage, I hear patience, I hear a lot of, you know, doubt, I hear a lot of fear and fear in the good sense of like, okay, I am not certain as to what's going on here, but you know what, I'm going to stay true. And I also hear a lot of confidence, a lot of faith. And sometimes it's hard in those moments of darkness to, to keep the faith. And what I, uh, what I hear from you is the fact that, you know what, you never lost faith, you had the doubt but you never lost faith. And that's a really, really good thing. And what can we tell people in those moments of uncertainty? And you know what? When we have a dream, we have a goal, uh, we have something that every single compass is telling us, like, you know what? This could be a bad idea. Well, maybe, like, you know, maybe I should have stayed in that nine to five. What can we tell them? We, um, you're always going to have, it's that, it's your inner thought. I, I would say don't make any decisions while you're, for example, let's say you, you don't like your job. I wouldn't say that you should quit because you had an argument with your coworker or you felt like you were having a bad day. Um, I say for me, I still, uh, just a little backstory, uh, not even a story, but for me, when I decided that I was going to leave, it was the most peaceful time. I didn't have any issues with the coworkers. I didn't have any in, animosity towards anyone at the job. I didn't feel anything, but I just knew that it was my time. So I didn't react based on emotions, but more so it was, I knew that it was my time. Um, as I was driving to work one day, I w- it was just very peaceful for me. And I just, a lot of people, depending on what your faith is, it could be your gut, it could be universe, it could be God. For me, it was God. It was just like, you know, this is your time. Like I knew that it was my time. So when I came in, to work. It was a random day. I did not plan on leaving at all. And I just told him that this will be my last month. So there's going to be a lot of naysayers in your own mind. You have to learn how to, um, there is a word for it to not decipher, but, um, dang, I forgot the word. It's a word that, that it's, it's, you have to know, you kind of like know it that you Mm -hmm. have to do it. Mm -hmm. But then there's always going to be that voice in your head. That's like, that's not it. But trust, Mm -hmm. trust your instinct and your gut 
that whatever decision you're making is going to be it. Now, whatever plan that you had or you wrote down, it's not going to be a straight and narrow path. It's going, there are going to be troubles that comes along to make you think that whatever decision that you made was not the right decision. But it's always going to be just going to plan out because it has to play out. The only time that it will not play out is if, you, if, you, if you're dead. That's it. But as long as you're alive, it's going to plan out the way it's supposed to if you're making the right decisions for you and others as well. So if you're going to be making bad decisions, of course not. But if it's going to be for your own good and you know that this is what you want, because at the end of the day, we know what's going to help us. We know what we need to do. It's just a matter of how do we do it or if we're willing to do it. So whatever it is that's inside of you that you're afraid to do, whatever it is, I would say whatever it is that keeps you up at night, what are you, what are you more stressed about? Whatever it is that keeps you up at night is what you need to figure out when you wake up, how every single day, how am I going to be working towards this one thing to make sure that I don't, it doesn't stress me out every single night. So every single last one of us has that one thing or a couple of things that we, at night before we go to bed, it, our spouse might not know it, but we know it deep down inside. You know, what, you know that you need to work on your finances. You know that you need to leave your job. You know that you need to go to another job. You know that you need to go to another career. So you have to find that deep within to be able to move on to that next position, if that makes sense. <laughs> that makes total sense. That makes total sense. You just jolted my soul right there. It's like, wow. Like, <laughs> seriously. Good. No, real talk. I'm, I'm very serious. This is the stuff that people need to hear because it's a truth that we have to come to face with because, you know, we need to take responsibility for ourselves. You know, the hand-me-downs are not going to come. And you know what? As you said, like, you know, the lottery tickets are not going to come but we can take the right decisions and put in the right steps and put in the right habits and take in, you know, the right, you know, you know, the right education and, you know, seek help. There's nothing wrong with seeking help. There's nothing wrong with admitting the way, what we don't know, but we need to, first of all, believe, believe that we can deserve, believe that we can have, believe that, you know, it's, there's, you know, greatness out there for us. Um, I, I really, I really want to thank you for that because it's something that a lot of people need to hear from people as empowered or as devoted and as, you know, just generous as you are. Like, seriously, it's something that, that is really true. Um, final, final question, because I don't want to keep you up too late because you've been so generous with so much energy. <laughs> I, can't, I can't thank you enough. But yeah. there's, one, there's one last post that you put. And I don't know what we're just talking about, you know, post from here, post from there, but it's something that I really buy into because I follow you a lot. You know, we interact a lot on the Instagrams of the world, yeah. but there's something that you put out, you know, I wake up every day thinking about the life I deserve. And what does that look like for you? Oh, the life I deserve. I know that, um, I, I would say like maybe two years ago, I was listening to something and, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I don't think it was, I think it was a motivational or um, a sermon. I don't remember. Um, but I was on YouTube. I was listening to it. And it said that we are deserving of a great life and not self, you know, of course it comes with suffering, but we are God's creation and we're supposed to live a life that reflects God because God is supposed to be, um, the ultimate and we're in his image so we can't we can't be mediocre is what I'm trying to say uh -huh. so I know if I know that I'm God's greatest creation I can't be trying to live a mediocre life and I think that's really what struck with me was a lot of times we're willing to settle and we're not willing to look at ourselves and look at who we really are, what we're really capable of. Because a lot of times it's probably conditioned when you were a child, when you, you know, the way that you grew up, relationships that you've had. I know for me, what also hinders me is the relationship that I did not have with growing up without my parents. So that also affects me. 
in the way that I sometimes lack confidence in myself or not knowing how to love properly because that also affects me because I don't know how to do either one. And nobody really built up confidence in me growing up. So I don't even know what that is. A lot of the things that I had to learn myself, but when I realized that I am deserving of these things, it changed my perspective. So for me, the life, um, it's, it says the life I desire, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the life I desire is to be impactful, you know, with the information that I have, also help other people, um, especially my gift is finance. So it's to empower people financially. So that is why I put in the work myself because you can't pour from an empty cup. So I can pour out to others after I filled myself up. So the life I desire, I know requires for me to be able in a position to give back. And I can't give back if I don't have anything. And I know that I can give back if I'm hustling, working three jobs. I won't be able to do so. So in order for me to be able to live the life I desire, which is a life of abundance, not only for money, but for health and also wealth, and also being able to give back and bring a brother or sister with me, I have to put myself in a position where money comes to me, you know, at a, you know, at, you know, abundantly, and I'm not worrying about money and I'm just working a life of passion and allowing my gift to help other people. And I'm not stressing. Of course, there's going to be stressing. There's always going to be problems, Mm -hmm. but at the core of it, I am living and I'm helping other people and I'm not stressing out. I'm a living testimony that things can be done despite where you come from, despite your obstacles, Mm -hmm. you know, living that type of life and being a testimony and having, you know, resources to be able to help other people. That's the life that I desire. There you go. There you go. And every day in every way, I hope that, you know, this next morning or maybe tomorrow or the day after is yet another awakening to this life that you desire and that you deserve. Um, Seriously, I'm humbled. Uh, I'm bashful. I'm really like I'm twitching right now because it's a very precious time uh, that you've allowed us uh, to share with you and your story very briefly. But, you know, it's definitely something that I'm going to use the word again. I celebrate you for it's a story of truth. It's a mission of service. It is a selfless mission It's a mission of empowerment, but also to show us that every day in every way through our own actions, decisions, disciplines, adventures, and misadventures, Mm -hmm. it is possible. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you are a true testament of. And I really want to thank you for this tremendously precious time uh, because there's nothing more precious than time. It's the one resource that we we can't get more of. But when we choose to create space and to share it with another like-minded, awesome being, Galita, that is definitely you. It's definitely something I want to thank you for. It's a tremendous, tremendous thing. Thank you so much for this wonderful exchange. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, allowing me to share my story, my truth, my testimony. And I really had a great time. I, I love doing this. I love talking about it. So for you to invite me into the podcast, I'm really honored. <laughs> Final, final one. This is one thing I just opened up the floor to the guests. So it's not to put you on the spot. It's just one final thought, a quote, a call to action, just a, you know, just a personal mantra you might have. You know, everybody can actually wake up tomorrow and, you know, just take that next step towards the next level. Not sure if there's something you can lead them with. Be the change that you want to see. That's it. That's it. Be the change that you want to see. If you don't like something, change it. If you, if you see that you can change something, do it and this is just a little i know we're closing but no, i just sure. one thing um i remember if you're be, being true to yourself and being true to others is so important i remember at my job that i was at i would i worked there for six years i was only i only called out twice and didn't show up to work i had perfect attendance all 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 the time even until me leaving 
whatever you do um, in life, do it with your heart. Do it even if, if other people did, did you wrong or do you wrong. As long as you know whatever you did was not to be, um, you know, try not to, you know, not to harm other people or trying to do tit for tat. Mm-hmm. As long as you know what you did is, you know, with the with your heart, it's always going to repay you later on. And a lot of times I remember when I was, when I put in my notice to leave my job, a lot of people are like, you still showing up to work on time. You're still doing your job. But th- that always stuck with me because I know that even until I'm leaving, even though I wasn't happy, I still did my duty and I still did what I had to do. Yes. When, you, when you do something like that and you wake up, even if you don't like your job, even if you don't like it, if you, even if you're an habitual person who's late, try showing up to work on time. It might not be your job that you don't like. It might be you that needs to change. Or it might not be, it might not be your job that don't want to promote you. Maybe you're holding yourself from the promotion. So try to change a couple things about the way that you show up to work, the way that you love your spouse. Do something different. If you don't like your job, change yourself. And if you're changing yourself and your job is not changing, then you can still change yourself by removing yourself. There you go. There and you that's go. it. <laughs> no no more. Okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. We definitely need this because you're so right. Because definitely, like, you know, you are part of the world. And once you change yourself, you change the world. And that's as basic as that. Uh, obviously, for people who want to connect with you, my dear, where can we connect with you on the interwebs? <laughs> I'm, I'm on all platform, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Galita G, uh, my first name, and G-E-E. So it's G-U-E-L-I-T-A and then G-E-E on all platforms. Um, and my website is www.financialquench.com. There we go. I'll definitely link up all the web presences and all the all the presences, all the social media profiles on the blog post once it goes live. Kalita, it's been a tremendous, tremendous honor and a thrill. Uh, this is probably not the last of our interactions. As you know, it's a pleasure to always connect with you offline. And uh, again, this is uh, really something that I'm truly, truly cherishing because I learned a lot. And uh, thank you so much. Of course, every, anybody who actually wants to check in with you, I'll definitely uh, make sure that, you know, they have all the right uh, directions to actually connect with you. Guys, another episode of the Awakening the Awesome podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Always shows your support. Always available on iTunes and Google. You know where to find us. You know, iTunes reviews are always appreciated, as you guys know. As always, guys, have a terrific evening. Stay blessed. Stay safe. As always, do. Stay awesome. This has been another episode of the Awaken the Awesome podcast. We always love to get your feedback, so please do drop us a line via Instagram, Facebook, or email. Our email address, awakentheawesome at gmail.com. Do visit our official website at awakentheawesome.ca, where you can find our entire back catalog of episodes and incredible guests. Also, if you haven't already, please hop on over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, give us a rating, and leave us a review, as this helps us tremendously in growing this podcast and spreading the word to more awesome listeners like you. We always appreciate your support, and thank you for listening. Stay awesome.